can tell me not to give my children medication, and by definition it's good. How can we know? The divine will won't change. One day God might forbid murder and the next encourage it. In fact, as kings changed the throne, the values changed. We had King Richard and then we have King John. Moral goodness then becomes nothing more than obedience to a superior power. Nietzsche suggests, this is a suggestion, that if there is no God, then anything is morally permissible. In other words, if there's no standard of morality, who gets to make the rules? In other words, there would be no reason to limit our freedoms. Kant and Mill wanted to rely on reason for moral truth. Aristotle wanted to rely on reason for moral virtue. Nietzsche asks, what if reason fails? After all, we don't all agree. And this gives rise to what he calls ethical nihilism, that there are no answers, or ethical skepticism, we cannot know the answers. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Now he says, throughout the course of Western history, we have dealt with ethics from one of two perspectives. Either it's teleological, that actions produce consequences, and we examine the consequences to determine if the action's right, or we examine the actions, and that becomes a duty that you have to obey. You'll see this in Western religions as well. We talked about Dharma and Karma and Samsara when we talked about Hinduism. Okay. Nietzsche's revelation is this. The intention of an action is only a sign or a symptom that needs interpreting. It's like the skin that conceals something yet deeper that still needs to be uncovered. The historical dilemma of morality, moral philosophy or philosophers have historically assumed that there is a rational ground of morality. They have assumed, however, their morality itself is a given. They lack the perspective to challenge the basic and underlying assumptions that their morality itself may be a problem. Universal standards to Nietzsche are imposed by the ruling elite who make the rules of morality for the rest of us. This is the divine command theory of ethics. Now, Nietzsche is going to say the problem with this is they fail to understand the nature of life itself. Now, this is the weird part, especially if you get it. Do I have any people studying the sciences? Anybody studying physics or anything? <clears throat> Physicists will tell you that all life is really nothing more than energy. And energy, in a way, kind of coalesces. So this is, material is just energy and waiting. If I put heat to this, it's going to create a fire, more energy. Everything is really energy, even if it's in a kind of a, a, a substantial state here where it's, it manifests itself as physical. Quantum physics tells us this, and string theory says the same thing. Now, it's all theory, so we're trying to comprehend whether that's right. Nietzsche says what drives all life on the planet, not just human life, what drives all life on the planet is something he calls the will to power. For Nietzsche, there's an innate drive within each one of us to accumulate power. Now think about that. When you eat, what are you accumulating? Energy, power, the power to work, the power to stay up, the power to do this, the power to do that. In a forest, trees are constantly accumulating energy. Without energy, they can't survive. They do that through photosynthesis, they do that through rain absorption, they do that through nutrient absorption. And the trees that absorb the most power survive even at the expense of those that can't manage. So you get the large trees, they block out the sunlight, and what you end up having is just a place for a pretty good forest fire, <laughs> dead wood, because it can't survive. Nietzsche uses these examples and says that the very core of life is the will to power. It's not a consciousness. It's a driving force that all living things have to grow. He calls the will to power growth. Babies, what do they do when they pop out of the oven? They, do a, they cry. They're expending energy, right? But then they want energy. They sleep so they can conserve energy, and they grow at an incredible rate. I mean, we reach a peak, an apex, and we quit growing, and that's, we, sometimes we grow these, but we quit. Everything Nietzsche says that's alive on the planet has this ingrained will to power, to grow. And it cannot be abated. If it's not fed, it will die. It's indiscriminate. If it doesn't grow, it will die. Now, he's not saying, therefore, we just stamp, st 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 trample on people or, or just obliterate people. He'll go on to say in a video that I'll play for you on Wednesday that oftentimes we form symbiotic relationships 
because it gives us more power. So here's a symbiotic relationship. It's called a classroom. And you bring your power to the classroom, and I bring my power to the classroom. And if we effectively combine our powers, you all get an A. But if you waste your power, I still get an A. Well, until you get to review me. It's a symbiotic relationship. You have 200 good bugs that live in your gut. If you don't take care of them, they won't take care of you. You could not digest food without these 200 bugs that live in your, bug, in your gut. When you put food in your face, they automatically emit an enzyme, and it helps them to eat food, and it helps us to digest food. We're in what's called a symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic relationship means two parties get something from each other. Not necessarily equal, but they get something from each other. So, I mean, honestly, I don't mean to stop. We're not on an equal relationship. That's why you're a student and I'm a professor. But we're in a symbiotic relationship. Professor, I didn't get my, 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 my essay in on time. Can I, can I have a little more time? Of course. Everybody gets a single pass. Symbiotic relationship. So I don't want to paint this will to power as being a negative thing that just tramples on people. Once in a while it does. If you attack me, oh, you better be good. Is that John Wick movie, you know, with a pencil? Anyway. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so at times there is confrontation and conflict. He calls that overcoming. The will to power is an innate drive to accumulate power for the sake of growth. And in that process of growth, we have to overcome. Sometimes you have to overcome things within yourself in order to proceed outside yourself. I, my, my youngest one, Corey, came down yesterday. He's supposed to go home at 6.30 this morning. He was sick. My middle boy brought a bug to everybody. So we were going to go to the golf tournament. They have a, a, a PGA tournament down in Innisbrook this weekend. And I said, Corey, I'm not feeling good. If I go out in that sun, it's just going to drain me. And then I got to go put in all these weeks. And so I'm not going to go. He said, well, neither am I. He said, in fact, I hope you don't mind. I canceled my morning flight, and I'm going out this afternoon. This was yesterday at 7 o'clock. I said, F works for me. I'll get you to the airport. So at 4 o'clock, I say, hey, listen, what time do we have to leave? And he says, well, let me check. Not only did he cancel his morning flight for this morning, Southwest Airlines canceled his other flight. Now he's got no flight, and he's freaking out. And I said, bup, 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 bup. I said, can we just find a solution to this? And I went online, got him a ticket at another airline. He was able to go home. He got home late midnight last night, but he got home. Taking his energy to overcome a situation so that he could empower himself. when he works for LinkedIn. He had to go to work today. So what Nietzsche is saying then is not negative. Periodically it creates a negative. You try and take my power from me, you better come with your best game. But oftentimes he says that we work in harmony. A forest works in harmony. Have you ever, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a tree hugger. Nature works in harmony. Now there's destruction, it happens. There's overcoming, it happens. Animals need to eat, we need to eat. But for the most part, when everything works in harmony, everything gets a benefit. Now, we're, all co we're not all co-equal. He understands that. That's where the idea of ubermensch comes from. Some of us accede to a higher development than others. It's not because we're given this divine right. We just, we accede to it. I talked to you about grad school when I went to graduate school, Doug Stalker and Paul Bamford. Did I ever mention those two names to you? <laughs> Doug Stalker's father, pioneers stripping varicose veins with a coat hanger. I have no idea how that happened. I really don't want to know. But Doug was a genius. He was already published in poetry magazines when he was 18. So he's, he's 22 in graduate school. And we're in class together. And you, know, and you can tell he's brilliant. And then there's this guy, Paul Bamford. Really, they got to be about 165 IQ, really brilliant people. Doug comes up to me one day after class, and he goes, uh, he goes, you're not the brightest one here, but you're the, you're the quickest one on your feet. How do you do that? I said, is, is that a compliment? <laughs> I said, what does that mean anyway? And he says, he says, how do you put it all together? All the, he says, how do you see the big picture? And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so he explained it to me. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I have power that other people don't have. But he's really brilliant. He said, by the way, how are you doing in Dick Zafrin's class? I said, we're studying P.F. Strawson's mind-body problem. Why? He says, are you getting it? And I said, eh, it's a little shady around the edges. He gives me five books, when they're published, who publishes them. And he says in the fifth book, he says, I think it's page 333 or 334 is the answer you're looking for. I said, do you mind if I hook myself to you for the rest of graduate school? 
this is a brilliant man. Why should I reinvent the wheel? He's a walking resource. Then Paul Manford, where I went to school, logic is everything. Do not take logic from me. It's not my favorite. I'd sit next to Paul. We go through, it was called Polish logic. That, that's not meant to be a slur against Paul. They just called it that. And they go through the class, and I'd watch it, and I'd take notes, and I'd look at Paul after class was over. I said, did you get that? And he said, sure. And I said, could you draw a picture of that for me? Sure. Can I take that home with me? Sure. Good. I'm going to hook myself to you, too. Symbiotic relationship where we're both ascending. Doug, obviously, and Paul, obviously, had their act together in a way I couldn't ascend to. I got that. But that didn't make them enemies. It didn't make us conflicting with one another. Although in Nietzsche's world, that could happen. OK? So do you understand what he's saying at the very bottom? Nietzsche builds his whole theory, I'm going to say, of morality, but it's not really morality. He builds his whole theory of morality on this will to power, this innate need to accumulate more and more and more power until you reach whatever level you're going to reach to. Everybody with me on that? OK, now, the problem with what Nietzsche is thinking is, is this. Nietzsche says that this is an innate drive. This is not consciousness, by the way. Like, here, let me explain this to you. You suddenly realize you're hungry. Your consciousness isn't saying you're hungry. You realize you're hungry. And then your consciousness kicks in and says, hmm, I wonder what I should eat today. But it's the NA drive that drives you to hunger, drives you to thirst, drives you to comfort, to warmth, to whatever you need. So it's this NA drive. Nietzsche says, if life is built upon this NA drive, and you have no choice but to feed this NA drive, then where's morality? You're not responsible for what you do because this thing is driving you. This is not consciousness. It's an innate drive. He calls it growth. Well, let's divide that in half for a minute. Let's say we are driven. But once I realize I'm hungry, I get to choose what I want to eat. Am I responsible for what I eat? Am I responsible for what I say when I'm in conflict? Am I responsible for what happens when I have other situations in my life? So the, what, what, I'm just going to show you. What's wrong with Nietzsche is Nietzsche doesn't accept that there's a higher responsibility after the drive, after the will to power occurs within us. But frankly, I agree with him. You are driven. And it's not on a conscious level. It's on a subconscious level. And then Nietzsche says, after that, consciousness accompanies the will to power. It comes into play because we are players on a field. We have to make decisions based on whatever that drive opens up. Like, where are you going to go and work after this? Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? Those are decisions, conscious decisions we have to make. But the need to survive, that will that we need to accumulate, that is driven in us. OK, so do we follow that? Any questions about that at all? How many of you agree with that? I have at least one, two, three. And the rest of you all make these decisions on your own, right? About two years ago, the French did an interesting experiment. They hooked people up. You know, we know, we know that this is reason back here, and this is, you know, and we hooked them up. We sat them down at a table and said, we want you to just do nothing. And when you're hungry, raise your hand. And when you're thirsty, raise your hand. And so they just sat there all morning and all afternoon. And one of them said, I'm thirsty. And another one said, I'm hungry now. And what they discovered was, because they were doing EKGs, they were doing brain waves. And what they discovered is before the person realized they were hungry and before the person realized they were thirsty, their brain had already gone off. In other words, it didn't go off in response to them saying, I'm hungry or I'm thirsty. Their brain went off and they said, oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I'm thirsty. Well, from a scientific point of view, we're looking at it and we're thinking, 